Denmark is, you know, a prosperous and forward-thinking nation in Northern Europe. With a population of nearly 6 million people, it stands as a significant economic power. The country consistently ranks high in global metrics for GDP per capita and overall quality of life. Its society is known for being highly digitized, with citizens and businesses alike relying heavily on technology for daily interactions. This digital maturity makes Denmark a fascinating case study for technological policy. The government's decisions in this area often signal future trends for other developed nations. It is within this context of innovation and economic strength that a major technological shift is now taking place, one that could really redefine how governments manage their digital infrastructure for years to come. At the heart of every computer, from a personal laptop to a massive government server, lies an operating system. Think of it as the foundational software that manages all the hardware and other software on the device. It is the bridge between you and the machine, allowing you to run programs, save files, and connect to the Internet. For decades, Microsoft Windows has dominated this space, becoming the standard for governments and corporations around the world. Its familiar interface and vast ecosystem of compatible software have made it the default choice. This widespread adoption, however, creates a significant dependency on a single company for critical functions, a situation that is now being re-evaluated by Danish leaders. In a bold and deliberate move, the Danish government has announced its intention to transition a significant portion of its digital systems away from Microsoft. The plan, set to begin in the summer of 2025, will see approximately half of the computers within the Ministry of Digital Affairs switch from Microsoft Windows and the Office 365 suite to Linux and its open source equivalent, LibreOffice. This is not a minor technical update. It represents a fundamental change in philosophy. This decision signals a deliberate step toward a different kind of digital future, one where control, security and independence are prioritized over convenience and market dominance. The implications of this move extend far beyond the walls of a single ministry. This transition is about more than just swapping one piece of software for another. It is a strategic choice rooted in a desire to build a more resilient and self-sufficient digital state. By moving to Linux, an open source operating system, Denmark is embracing a platform that is not owned or controlled by any single corporation. Linux is developed by a global community of programmers, and its code is open for anyone to inspect, modify, and improve. This transparency offers a level of security and flexibility that proprietary systems, whose inner workings are kept secret, simply cannot match. This shift is a clear statement about Denmark's long-term vision for its technological infrastructure. The primary motivation behind Denmark's decision can be summed up in just two words. Digital sovereignty. This concept refers to a nation's ability to have control over its own digital destiny, free from the influence or control of foreign entities, whether they are other governments or multinational corporations. Danish Minister for Digital Affairs, Caroline Stage Olsen, has been very clear about this objective. She expressed concern that too much public digital infrastructure is currently tied up with very few foreign suppliers. This heavy reliance, she argued, creates vulnerabilities that a modern state cannot afford to ignore. The goal is not to become isolated, but to ensure the government retains the power to act freely in the digital realm. This pursuit of freedom and safety is a direct response to the current technology landscape. A handful of giant American tech companies dominate the software, cloud computing, and digital services markets. While their products are powerful and convenient, their control over essential infrastructure presents risks Governments using these services can become subject to the company's terms of service, pricing changes, and data policies. Furthermore, geopolitical tensions could potentially disrupt access to these critical tools. By diversifying its technology portfolio with open-source alternatives like Linux, Denmark is building a safeguard against such dependencies. It is a proactive measure to ensure its digital operations are not held hostage by foreign corporate interests. The Danish government's statement emphasizes that this move is not about digital nationalism or closing its doors to international technology. Instead, it is a practical strategy to enhance resilience. In a world where cyber attacks are increasingly common and sophisticated, relying on a single technology vendor creates a single point of failure. 
If a major vulnerability is discovered in Windows, it could impact the entire government. By introducing Linux into the mix, Denmark diversifies its technological ecosystem. This makes it a harder target for attackers and ensures that an issue with one system does not bring the entire government to a standstill. It is a calculated move to strengthen the nation's digital defenses from the ground up. Essentially, Denmark wants the freedom to choose its own technological path. The leaders believe that true sovereignty in the 21st century requires control over the digital tools that power the state. By adopting open-source software, the Danish government gains the ability to inspect the source code, customize it to its specific needs, and manage its own updates and security patches. This level of control is impossible with proprietary software like Windows, where the user is entirely dependent on Microsoft for updates and support. It is a shift from being a mere consumer of technology to becoming an active participant in its development and management, thereby securing a greater degree of autonomy for the nation. The transition from a familiar ecosystem like Microsoft Windows and Office to Linux and LibreOffice will undoubtedly present challenges for government employees. For years, office workers have been trained on Microsoft products. Word, Excel, and PowerPoint are second nature to them. Shifting to LibreOffice Writer, Calc, and Impress will require a significant investment in training and support. While the programs offer similar functionalities, their interfaces and specific features differ. The government will need to manage this change carefully, providing ample resources and patience to help employees adapt. The initial period may see a temporary dip in productivity as workers navigate the new software, a necessary growing pain on the path to greater digital independence. Beyond the immediate impact on workers, this change will have ripple effects for citizens and businesses interacting with the government. For instance, digital forms and documents created in LibreOffice must be fully compatible with the software used by the public. The government must ensure that a citizen using Microsoft Word can seamlessly open, edit, and return a document sent from a government office using LibreOffice. Maintaining this interoperability is crucial to avoid creating new digital barriers. This technical challenge requires meticulous planning and testing to ensure that the transition enhances rather than hinders the efficiency of public services and communication between the state and its people. On the other hand, this move could foster a more robust local IT industry. By moving away from a single vendor contract, Denmark opens the door for local IT companies to provide support, training, and custom development for the new open source systems. This could stimulate economic growth and create high-tech jobs within the country. Instead of sending large sums of money to a foreign corporation for software licenses, that investment can be redirected into the domestic economy. This not only supports local businesses, but also builds a national base of expertise in open source technologies, further strengthening the country's long-term digital sovereignty and technical capabilities. For the public, the most significant long-term benefit could be enhanced data security and privacy. Open source software is often lauded for its transparency, which allows security experts from around the world to scrutinize its code for vulnerabilities. This public oversight can lead to more secure and trustworthy systems. Citizens can have greater confidence that their personal data, held within government systems, is protected by software that is not secretly collecting information for a foreign corporation. This commitment to transparency and security can strengthen the trust between the government and the people it serves, a cornerstone of a well-functioning democratic society. Denmark's decision serves as a powerful example for other countries, particularly within the European Union, that are also grappling with issues of digital sovereignty. Many nations are becoming increasingly uneasy about their deep reliance on a small number of non-European tech giants. The Danish initiative demonstrates that a viable alternative exists. It shows that a government can take concrete steps to reclaim control over its critical digital infrastructure. By successfully navigating this transition, Denmark will provide a valuable roadmap for other nations to follow, detailing the challenges, solutions, and ultimate benefits of embracing open-source solutions at a national level. This could inspire a broader movement across the continent. The move highlights a growing global conversation about the power of big tech and the need for greater digital self-determination. For too long, the default choice has been to license proprietary software from the largest market players, 
often without fully considering the long-term strategic implications. Denmark's action forces a re-evaluation of this status quo. It encourages policymakers worldwide to ask critical questions. Are our digital foundations secure? Are we overly dependent on foreign suppliers? Do we have the freedom to act in our nation's best interest? Denmark is proving that these are not just theoretical questions. They are practical policy issues with actionable solutions. Other countries will be watching this transition closely to see what lessons can be learned. They will observe how Denmark manages the technical challenges of migration, how it handles employee training, and how it ensures continued interoperability with the rest of the world. The success or failure of this project will have a significant impact on the confidence of other governments considering a similar path. If Denmark can demonstrate tangible benefits, such as cost savings, enhanced security and greater flexibility, without causing major disruptions, it will significantly lower the perceived risk for others. It could be the proof of concept that many nations have been waiting for. Ultimately, Denmark's bold step toward Linux and open source software is more than a simple IT project. It is a political statement about the future of the digital state. It champions a vision where nations are not merely passive consumers of technology, but active architects of their digital environments. It suggests that values like transparency, collaboration, and self-determination can and should be embedded in the very code that runs a country's government. As we move deeper into the digital age, the Danish experiment may well be remembered as a pivotal moment, a turning point where nations began to reclaim their sovereignty, one line of open source code at a time.